dynamics of stacks and your uh, master level. Thanks. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking about how stars move and interact with each other uh, around mass black holes. So before I get into the talk, I want to say that the main um, idea behind the talk um, is that stars, which uh, are in the vicinity of a mass black hole, will move along ellipses. And these ellipses will process slowly. And as they process, they exert torques on each other. So that's the underlying idea behind everything I'm going to present. And I'll say I'll go into more detail. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about uh, the nearest system we have to observe, that's our galactic center. It's home to uh, a mass black hole and a Sagittarius A star that has four million solar masses. What I'm most interested in is uh, the fact that it's embedded in a nuclear star cluster. Um, and within uh, about one parsec of the mass black hole, so that there's on order of about a uh, million solar masses and stars and compact objects. So it's a, a very dynamically rich environment. Um, there are puddles in, in these stars around the mass black holes, which I'll go into. Uh, then I'm going to uh, give some theory, the most recent theory we have on stellar dynamics around the mass black hole, and try and uh, to use that recent theory to explain some of the puzzles that we see in the stellar population. And finally, I'll present some new theoretical ideas based on this theory um, that have not yet been tested, but are interesting nonetheless. So to introduce you to the Galaxy Center, I have a movie um, made by the European Southern Observatory. So what they've done here is take real data from um, almost two decades of um, astrometrically tracking the, the motions of stars as they orbit the mass black hole in the center of the galaxy. Uh, we're, zoom we're zoomed in here to a, a few tenths of a parsec. Um, so yes, yeah, so they've they reconstructed the stellar orbits from these motions. And they've color-coded the stars according to their spectral type. Uh, these blue and white stars are um, AEB stars, massive luminous stars, very close to the mass black hole. These are called the S stars, that I'll talk about later. Um, the red stars are uh, luminous red giants. These are older stars. So we have enough data on the stars around the mass black hole in the center of our galaxy to start testing long-standing theoretical predictions of how the stars move and how they interact with each other, essentially how they then distribute themselves around the mass black hole. So I'm going to present uh, two expectations um, that, that we have from the 70s, basically, when people started uh, working on this topic. So the first is that you would expect no young stars around the mass black hole. The reason for that is simply that if you put something as tenuous as a molecular cloud near a mass black hole, the, the tidal forces would rip it apart before it has time uh, to fragment, condense, and form stars in that region. Um, and for stars to diffuse inwards towards the mass black hole, uh, you need a long time. So you, for that reason, you don't expect young stars right beside the black hole. Uh, the second prediction is that you would expect the old stars that have had time to diffuse inwards and move towards the center of the potential um, through two-body relaxation, we would expect them to form a very steep density cusp around the black hole. This is a, a famous result by Bachmol and Wolf that the number density profile would go as or to the minus 7 over 4. So we know now um, from observations of the galactic center that the both these predictions are entirely incorrect. Uh, so now I'm going to go uh, into some of the observations of the stars around the mass black hole um, and to suggest how we can explain them. So the first thing is that uh, the, the stars around the mass black hole, far, far from being a, a place to board of young stars, it's actually teeming with early type stars. And not only that, but the majority of the very youngest stars are actually rotating in, in a clockwise disk in the sky. So I'm showing a plot here by Luella, 2009. The, the blue stars here, are those that are associated with a, a disk potentially rotating on the sky. And if you look at the angular momentum vectors of the stars, they're, they're actually forming a very thin plane. These stars, uh, the majority are O and Wolf Ray stars, very young, um, very hot and massive, about 6 million years old. Uh, and they go out to about half a parsec, so we're still well within the radius of influence of the mass black hole, which is about 2 to 3 parsec. 
Um, so how did they get there? So there's two competing theories. Um, the disfavored theory at the moment um, is that these stars uh, formed in a very young and massive cluster just outside uh, the few central parsecs of the galaxy and, and then in spiraled inwards under dynamical friction. So the reason this is disfavored is because these stars are about six million years old, which gives you a very short time scale to get this massive cluster uh, right beside the mass black hole. Um, it would have to be formed very close to the mass black hole and in addition be extremely massive and have a very dense core and there's all these restrictions that make it highly improbable. The, the favorite theory at the moment is that we're forming these stars in dense accretion disks around mass black holes. So a uh, molecular cloud, as I said, would be ripped apart by the tidal force, but if the gas um, which is coming into a galactic nucleus um, can um, have some net angular momentum that's going to be squashing it, uh, along this plane, becoming very dense, that can overcome the tidal forces, fragment and then from the start. Uh, so in recent papers um, that have studied this to see what type of structure do we get if the molecular cloud does form this, uh, this dense accretion disk and then fragment, um, they, they find some unusual results. Um, this here is by Van Allen Rice in 2008, the same results are found by Hobbes and also uh, Hopkins and Cotard very recently. Uh, and that is that the stars that are forming within these disks uh, do some non circular orbits, but actually on the central orbits that are even coherently aligned, like so, like this. Um, so, we wanted uh, to have a look at this and see well, what happens to stars when they form in such coherent disks. Is that matter of initial condition? Why, oh. why are they circular? Is it because the disk has a circular lines? The Sorry. disk itself, it looks like just a material coming from a stream and hasn't really impacted the cell and has a circular lines. It, 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 is, it, is, it is very much dependent on initial conditions. Yes. Um, I'm not entirely sure um, what initial conditions favor forming this. Um, the most recent paper by Hopkins and Picard, they get this naturally from their simulations, um, this when they're starting on galactic scales going all the way down it. Um, but yes, very much the structure of the form that's interesting is within the disk. It depends on the mass of the, of the gas going in with. Um, so yeah, so we were interested in knowing like, what, what type of uh, yeah, what type of dynamics would be happening within um, disks that look like this. Um, uh, okay. Um, so we know that stars can form in disks um, around mass black holes, um, but there are still a few more uh, puzzles that we were trying to solve um, from doing end-body simulations of stars in these disks. So the first thing, I'm going to show three here, um, is that if we look at the galactic center and look at the Owen Wolfe stars, uh, we can plot their eccentricity. So we were at eccentricity on the x-axis and the number of stars. It, it's only quite to see, but I'll show you here. Um, we've got a broad peak centered at like 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 eccentricity, and then a higher peak um, with very high eccentricities. So you've got a bimodal distribution that's highly non-zero. Uh, the, these stars are very young, about 6 million years old. So even if they all formed a coherently eccentric disk but roughly the same eccentricity, it's not clear how you could get uh, such a distribution. Uh, within such a short time scale. Um, so the, 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 the second puzzle to do um, for these stars is that about, um, at a radius of about 10 times uh, closer to the mass of black hole, at the inner edge of the disk, we have these S stars. This movie is from the UCLA group in, um, in LA. Um, so these S stars, these are these are P stars. They're, they are isotropically distributed and highly more eccentric much more eccentric than the disk stars. So it's not clear how they are related, if they're related at all. They, they didn't form in situ, they're far too close. You can't, even if you have a, a disk that's fragmenting, you can't form these stars where we see them. Um, the third uh, puzzle that we're hoping to unite is um, the fact that we see hypervelocity stars in the galactic halo. <coughs> and if you trace back their origins, they lead back to the mass black hole. So these are stars with higher velocities than escape velocity at their position. 
they're flying out of the galaxy and tracking back to the orbit. If you see they're coming from the center of the galaxy. Um, okay, so I'm hoping to unite this in, in this talk, these three puzzles, with um, dynamics of stars in coherently eccentric disks, like you get from the, the simulations that I showed before. Um, okay, so a couple of slides to do with stellar dynamics now, what the stars going to be experiencing when they're in the disk. So uh, this is the picture I showed um, or here, so this is a mass black hole with two stars. And what I was saying is that stars that are orbiting a mass black hole do so on ellipses. Okay, so they're repeating the same orbit again and again for long time scales. Um, so on a time scale that's longer than their orbital period, but less than their precession time. So that's the time it'll take for the orbit to process completely around the plane. These stars, you can approximate them by cell, their, their cell orbit. So you think the mass of the star being spread out along the orbit. Then you can understand that these stellar orbits are torquing each other uh, because they're massive elliptical wires. And torquing the rate of change of angular momentum. That means that angular momentum of the star is going to be changing over this time scale um, linearly with time. I mean, this is a much faster mechanism to change the angular momentum of the stars uh, than, say, two body relaxation, which goes to the square root of time. Um, there's another very important um, dynamical process that will happen within this, uh, or any stars around a mass black hole, and that's the fact that they're going to process due to um, the, the additional potential due to the surrounding stars. It's not just a mass black hole with the potential, there are surrounding stars nearby. Um, so I've shown this here, this mass black hole and a star. So if there was only a mass black hole and this potential, the star would be performing a covariant ellipse and would remain like that for all time. Um, due to the additional potential of the stars in its vicinity, it's going to start processing it in this direction. So this is what I mean when I say that um, precession is in retrograde motion. The star here is only in counterclockwise, um, but uh, its precession is in the opposite direction. Uh, a third point about precession that's going to be very important when we're thinking of the torques between stars and the disk is that precession is fastest for low asymptotic orbits, for circular orbits, uh, and slower for high asymptotic orbits. So the way to think about this is that if you're on a radial orbit going towards a mass black hole, you're not going to take time to start processing in the direction when you're straight to the black hole. Whereas the more circular the orbit is, the easier it is to start processing. The final thing I want to say is just to repeat that precession is slow, which means that over long time scales, there's going to be coherent force between orbits. Okay, so I'm going to show results of an n-body simulation in the form of the move here um, to show you that when you start stars off in one of these coherently eccentric disks that you get from the hydrodynamic simulations, it's inherently unstable. So in this simulation, we have a mass black hole. Um, I have a, a disk that starts off coherently eccentric. All the stars are of the order of 0 0.6 eccentricity. The spread of semi-major axes. I'm plotting their orbits here, even though it's an n-body simulation. And I'm just picking out a few stars. So underlying this, there is a smooth potential um, of background stars that's going to provide correct precession. Um, the reason I've color-coded one of the stars red is because at the very beginning of the simulation, this star gets just slightly more eccentric than the rest of the stars in the disk, uh, just due to normal two-body interactions with other stars. And we want to see what happens if to show why this is an unstable situation. So all the stars in the disk are rotating in this direction. And so the velocity vector of this star is pointing outwards. We're looking um, flat onto the, the disk here. We know when I set the, the moving star, because they have retrograde precession, the disk is going to want to go this way. Um, the thing to remember is that precession is slowest. It's, it's slow for um, more highly eccentric orbits. So, when we set this going, you notice the, the red orbit is processing slightly behind the rest of the stars in the disk, uh, as expected, because it's slightly more eccentric than the rest of the disk moves ahead of it. And now we can look to see well, what, what type of um, forces are going to be acting on this star, and, and what, what torque is going to be experiencing, and how is it going to change its orbit. So we 
still has a star orbiting in this direction, which means this is its velocity vector, it's going to be feeling a gravitational force from the rest of the stars into this in the opposite direction. So if we look at the angular momentum, um, an angular momentum vector of this red orbit, it's just its radius across its velocity vector. The torque it feels is radius across the gravitational force it feels. And then the force is acting in the opposite direction of its velocity vector. And that means that the torque will be acting to decrease its angular momentum vector. And these are, these are all coplanar, so if it's decreasing its angular momentum, what that means is that it's increasing its eccentricity. So just to repeat that, the star starts off just slightly more centric, processing behind the rest of the stars in the disk, and will feel a gravitational torque, which will make it even more centric. So if I keep the movie going, you'll see it's going to just continue to get more and more and more centric. It's an unstable situation for the star to be in. And at this point, it gets so eccentric that general relativistic precession kicks in, which is prograde, and will move it in the opposite direction. So I can let them really just keep going for a moment, but I can say that this happens in the opposite direction for more circular orbits. Circular orbits process ahead of the disk will feel a force that makes it more circular. So the stars, just through natural two-body interactions, will um, get these tiny deviations from the average eccentricity, and they'll want to explode away from each other. What's the density of a so in, in this simulation, it's alpha equals 1.5. Um, the reason I chose that is because the precession time you have alpha, alpha equals 1.5 plus um, it is independent of semi-major axis. So if, if you have a flatter um, profile, such as in galactic center, um, what happens is uh, the, the precession time goes such that stars that are closest the mass black hole in semi major active space, they actually lag behind in precession, and you expect them to become more and more centered. Whereas if you have a steeper crust, you expect those to become more circular. So, yeah. Right, so what I'm showing you here, uh, this is 1 minus eccentricity. These are examples of um, the eccentricity evolution of stars from the disk. So I started all the stars off at about 0 0.6 eccentricity. This is uh, units of time. This is 3 million years up here. So this is an extremely rapid uh, dynamical mechanism. Um, so what you can see is the stars start off at 0 0.6 eccentricity. And some of them go to extremely high eccentricities in very short time scales, while others uh, go to more circular orbits. What I want to point out here is that this is a very uh, smooth eccentricity evolution that shows you this is a secular factor, a, a long time effect. This is not due to the scattering of stars within the disk. Yeah. So what percentage of stars become so highly eccentric? Because most of the stars just feel really behind the disk, right? Sorry? Most the, is most of the mass in that stellar disk still leave behind to become a circular disk? Or? Uh, so it really depends on your initial conditions, um, how much mass you have within the disk, and also um, what's your initial distribution of eccentricity within the disk. Um, as I was saying, like the, the, the flatter your um, background stellar potential, the easier it is for stars to become more eccentric. Right. If it's only becoming eccentric due to the interaction with other stars in the disk, yeah. so you can't possibly make everybody eccentric. No, 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 sorry, yeah, that's right. You can't, you can't possibly make them all eccentric. Okay. Okay. So you can only make them Yeah, right. yeah. So um, how big is that fraction? Uh, okay, so the, the fraction does change. So it's easier to um, make stars with smaller semi-major axes um, go to extreme eccentricities because they have um, smaller um, mm -hmm. angular moments. So they're, they're the ones you should be focusing on. So if you make it easier for them to go to higher eccentricities, you're going to have a higher fraction um, of stars with higher sense of orbit. So in these simulations, um, I'll, I'll actually just show you the next plot so you get an idea. For these simulations, these ones were early ones, they're quite uh, simple. Um, so again, okay, so these are the observations of the Owen Wolf Ray stars here. Again, this is by normal distribution. I'm comparing it to one of the simulations um, where we started to start off at 0.6 eccentricity um, 
waited for six million years to compare it then to the Omo or Gray stars. And we find the bimodal distribution comes naturally out of uh, the simulations. And the reason for this is that you start stars off with some mean eccentricity and they want to explode either direction. This, uh, the magnitude of these peaks uh, and where exactly they peak is obviously dependent on the initial conditions. We, we can match this better, but you can see that the, the, the error bars are gigantic. We just need this as, um, yeah, uh, to show the mechanism naturally produces this violent distribution. But it, uh, you must not must mismatch it if you pick the wrong exit distribution circuit. So do you have to pick something around 0.6? Uh, yeah, so the, the best values are when you start off, right? 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Um, if you have a flatter um, background density potential, you can start off with lower density. Um, so, yeah, uh, in this situation, in these simulations, uh, only a few stars actually reach the highest eccentric frequency. They also oscillate back and forth because, you know, a highly eccentric star that lags behind the precession, the disks will actually catch up with it on a short time scale and then make it more and more circular. How long did it take for the distribution to come about? Say, like, for 600 years, but. 6 million years. Have the distribution. When does the final distribution? So, the, so this isn't a, a final asymptricity distribution. It keeps oscillating back and forth. The disk can puff out, so it, it can equilibrate after a while. So what's the minimum time to, to get a bimodal distribution? Yeah. I'm going to guess it's on the order of a million years, but uh, again, it's probably dependent on your initial conditions. Uh, and where you start, if you start all these stars off um, in circular orbit, don't get a, a bimodal distribution. It's about one secular time scale, right? Sorry? It's about one secular time scale, which is about a couple of years. Yes, yes. It, it, yeah. Um, a, a few procession times. <coughs> um, so, okay, so I said there were, there were three puzzles that we were trying to explain um, when you support the stars within a disk or in black hole. So, uh, the second and third puzzle, but these are the, the S stars that are even closer to the mass black hole and do not seem to be uh, along the, the disk plane. They're isotropically distributed. Um, and there's also the high velocity stars that we see in the black halo. So the, the idea behind the explanation is that if you have um, stars within the disk that are in binary systems, they go to very highly eccentric orbits. They can be disrupted by the mass black hole's um, tidal field, it, it unbinds uh, the, the binding energy between the binaries. And this is called tilt magnet. And what happens in this case is one of the stars will end up um, on a highly eccentric bound orbit around the mass black hole, uh, something that would look like the S star, while the remaining star gets a kick in energy and can form a hypervelocity star shooting out of the galaxy and can trace back its orbit or um, the um, to the mass black hole. Um, so yeah, uh, you form the high velocity stars here, and you could form the S stars here. So another thing I want to say is these high velocity stars, when you look at them on the sky, they are not isotropically distributed. And in a recent paper in UNL in 2009, um, they actually they fit the distribution of high velocity stars to great circles on the sky, so they were associated with planar structures. And there, there is a problem with this hypothesis then, that these hypervelocity stars have a travel time from the galactic center of order of 100 million years to 200 million years. So they could not have come from the current 6 million year old disk. So another project we're working on is hypothesizing that disk formation around mass black holes is a recurrent event. Episodic, episodic gas creation into um, galactic nuclei are, are repeatedly forming stars in the tidal photo. Um, the nuclear star cluster and mass black hole. Also, we know about we know the dropout of Mars and all about nuclear physics. I think those are just facts, right? And uh, these things are down from the galactic center. Uh, these stars here? Yeah. You're saying they don't come from the galactic center? Well, the sort of stuff that seems to come from the from the east of the galaxy, and uh, the rest of the river from down. I don't know if the start of things from the 
Now, if you just had two bodies of relaxation in this potential, this would be a noisy line centered at about zero. So this really visualizes the secular torques between stellar orbits over a long time scale. The precession time for this star is um, on the order of a thousand orbital periods. So we wanted something that could reproduce um, this type of statistic. So what we used uh, is called an ARMA model, that's autoregressive moving average model. Uh, we, we borrowed it from the metrics. Um, and I'll just go through it here quickly. This says the change in angular momentum of the star, that's J, at time t, is related to the previous step that took the angular momentum, so that it, that's the coherent torquing. Um, and there's also two terms here. So this is a um, uh, randomly distributed Gaussian variable, it has mean zero and uh, variance sigma squared. Um, and there's also this term here with Peter. Uh, says that the previous random variable that you took is carried along with you, so the moving average part of the, the equation. So, um, what else should I tell you about this? Uh, if you go back here, we calibrate the, the phi, theta, and sigma that's in that model with n-body simulation. Um, we get this curve here, the, the smooth green line. So that's telling you that this equation can reproduce the statistics of the secular torque and the two-body torque, is what uh, these terms do, um, of stars around the mass black hole. Um, so this is what we did. We related phi, theta, and sigma to parameters within our galactic nucleus model, and then calibrated it, the, the equation using n-body simulations. So now we have a, an equation for energy, an equation for angular momentum, so we can do the same type of simulations as the whole world did only incorporating the secular torques to stellar orbits. Uh, which, before I show you the result, uh, I want to bring in tidal disruption of stars. Um, so I'm showing here the mass black hole and the tidal radius for a given star around the black hole. So that's the radius of which uh, the star will become unbound and be ripped apart um, by the mass black hole. So if a star is on um, an orbit with a given semi-major axis, it's going to be moving slowly and it's in the major axis space, but it can move very fast in eccentricity or angular momentum space. And so it's in danger if it comes to the center of a periapse passing through the tidal disruption radius. So as it moves much further closer to the mass black hole, so it's on a much thinner orbit, so it can um, pass very close to the mass black hole with periapse. And you can combine them with resonant relaxation. Um, we find that this can carve out a hole in the stars around the mass black hole. So what I'm showing you here, this is um, the base phase distribution of uh, stellar population around the mass black hole um, as a function of energy. So here we have uh, energy on the x-axis on the log scale, um, or perhaps more conveniently in um, the radius of parsec. So this is going towards the mass black hole here on this side. This is black hole volts. Um, result. This is the e to the to the quarter result. So what we do, we start off our stars in a black hole and world distribution, and we let the secular torques uh, and two-body relaxation and tidal disruption uh, do its damage. And we can see after one big year, um, the stars, particularly around this radius, are being torqued so efficiently that many of them are entering the tidal disruption radius of the mass black hole and simply extract them from the simulation. Um, and about, so I should say that all the stars in this simulation have a mass of one solar mass, which is roughly correct to the radius of influence, but it's not going to be correct going towards the mass black hole. So the time scales do change depending on the mass that you have in the stars. But after about 10 big years, this hole is well established. Uh, you might notice that there's a recovery here, uh, going towards the mass black hole. The reason for this is um, general relativistic precession. So when the stars are too close to the mass black hole, and general relativity takes over, it's going to be processing rapidly a retrograde motion, and the torques can't build up on its orbit. So these stars aren't changing their eccentricities very fast, and so they can't be tightly disrupted. Of course, they're still moving in energy space, so eventually uh, the black hole gets Small. So, uh, I'm showing you here this is number density and this is radius. 
So now we're going towards mass black hole this way. Um, again, at t equals zero, we've set up a profile uh, with a black hole we'll press the end to the minus seven over four. Uh, after 10 gig year, you can see this type of profile is established. So the, the real core that we develop only goes out to about 0.03 parsec. Um, the, the, the slope will be changing out to about 0.1 parsec, but we're still too far away from the galactic center observations that say that this, this slope is changing out to 0.3 parsec. It seems to be pretty established. Um, so if we change, the, the model's very simplistic that we're using out of necessity. So we have a single mass distribution in this profile. Um, so we're always going to get the physics wrong at some radius. So if we change this to, to 10 solar masses, uh, we're more correct um, towards the mass level. hole. We're expecting to mass integration of you know, heavier objects. Then at the radius of influence, you, you have um, the time scales being correct. So these can all, uh, the time scales and the radius, radii can change slightly. But we're not getting out to um, the radii necessary for the galactic center yet. Um, one thing to say about this, though, is that we don't change the potential in response to the hole, right? So we start off with the potential of a black hole world profile, and the stars we populate in this potential, they're carving out a hole. The potential that we put all the stars into doesn't change. So this is something that will also affect the outer radius. Um, it should move outwards because uh, energy relaxation uh, is going to be slower if there's a hole in the potential in the mass black hole. Whereas resonance relaxation, the secular torques are not formally dependent on the amount of stars that you have within the radius. So this outer radius should move outwards. But um, yeah, we have improved it so far in the simulation. Um, okay. Uh, so the summary so far, I don't have a tiny thing extra to show. Um, first, that the, the bimodal eccentricity is in, in the disk and the galactic center. The S stars and the hypervelocity stars. They, they can be unified by the idea of um, uh, forming stars in coherently eccentric disks around black holes that become unstable. Um, um, although, although uh, to explain the F stars and the hypervelocity stars, we should, we should be evoking uh, repeated or episodic um, formation of stars and disks. Uh, I didn't go into this here. Um, we're looking for the remnants of an older disk in the galactic center at the moment. We've come up with statistic to try and distinguish between different formation scenarios, but I didn't actually explain that, so I won't go into it now. And the last thing is that the depression in the old star cluster next to mass black hole, we can partially explain due to resonant relaxation and tidal destruction, but whether or not we get out to the relevant radius, uh, we still have to find out. So the last thing I want to say, uh, the new project we've been working on, um, thinking about how secular dynamics Stellar torques are going to affect massive objects that are inspiring into a massive black hole in the galactic nucleus. The reason we're interested in this is that simulations of the inspirals of, say, intermediate mass black holes into galactic nuclei um, show repeatedly the increase in eccentricity of the ion pH, the intermediate mass black hole. Uh, here I have one minus eccentricity, so eccentricity increases as you go down, it's time, so uh, you see this in many simulations, many different papers. So we found that we could reproduce this result using only secular dynamics. And this is how uh, I like to explain it. So here we have a mass black hole here, intermediate mass black hole toward it. Um, and obviously we're looking down onto the plane here. And again, this is its eccentricity back here. Um, so so stellar orbits, we just, oh yeah, I should say this arrow is just the direction of precession of the intermediate mass black hole orbit, so it's going to be precessing around like this. So stars that are in this quadrant, you look and see what are they going to do to the intermediate mass black hole orbit? Is it going to increase in eccentricity or decrease in eccentricity? You can just, again, think of velocity and think of the force. So velocity is in this, this direction, the force it feels is in this direction. Um, so that means that uh, the torque mass black hole orbit is experiencing is going with its uh, direction of angular momentum. So increasing angular momentum, decreasing the eccentricity of the ion pH here. If so, orbits are located in this quadrant. The opposite happens in this quadrant. 
So you might think in a stellar cluster, all the orbits are isotropically distributed. So you won't have any secular evolution of the asymptotic of binary H. But if you split the potential now into prograde moving orbits and retrograde moving orbits, you see that it's not actually true. So prograde orbits, because they're, they've got the same orbital motion, we're just kind of thinking about a Cope-Bainer explanation here. Um, they're going to be processing in the same direction. So if the stellar orbit has the same angular, uh, same eccentricity and same angular axis, it's not actually going to be crossing the IMDH's orbit processing uh, along the same time scale. Whereas a retrograde orbit, uh, with the exact same orbital parameters, is going to be processing in the opposite direction, so this way, so it's going to continue to be entering this quadrant. And this quadrant here is such that IMDH's eccentricity is always increasing due to the uh, torques from the stars here. Um, and also, okay, so you're still going to have um, dynamical friction from the traditional chandra uh idea, which means that the mass black hole, or the intermediate mass black hole, is going to be decreasing in semi major axis. So as it decreases semi major axis, it's going to feel a fresh wind of retrograde orbits that enter this quadrant and donate negative angular momentum to it. So uh, just one quick test. Uh, we performed to make sure that we had the right idea that this was induction just due to gravitational scattering. Um, that my end body code, I simply reversed the direction of perception of the IMBH. And so it would interact with the prograde orbits instead. And so a prediction of this theory is that now the eccentricity of birth should be negative, which should be decreasing in eccentricity. And this is exactly what we find. Um, so here we have correct perception. These are um, results of 10 realizations each all these lines of the IMD agent spiral. Um, so this just shows you that this is the, the result we expected to find from doing the find it. Um, okay, so for the last slide, I just want to leave you um, with a movie. Uh, here's the IMD agent's orbit. This is a prograde directed star. Um, we call these orbits secular and horseshoe orbits because if you look in the frame co-rotating with the IMDH, the, um, the prograde orbit uh, directed star will perform a horseshoe orbit in its eccentricity vector, not the guiding center like it's going to be known in planetary dynamics. Um, but this gives you a nice idea of just how strong the torques are. The IMDH is changing um, the prograde orbit so dramatically on short time scale. Thank you.
there's still secular force, but it's not unstable uh, in that situation. So there are two questions. So for first, go back to the S star. You said uh, their distance is just about right for the field mechanism to work. So we're just calculating it. I think they're too far. Well, I could be wrong, so maybe it's just. Um, right, they're yes. about yeah. right, they're about 0.5 per sec or 0.1 per sec. Yeah. Okay, so let's say the binary that came in is about 1 AU because you need about 1 AU binaries to get the high velocity stars, which give you a velocity about a thousand of seconds. Okay, so um, yeah, I've been thinking about um, binary stars about like 0.1 to 1 AU. Yeah. Okay, so 1 AU binary star, and the, the massive black hole is only maybe a million times more massive, let's say. So that means the tidal destruction radius is about 100 AU. Of the binary, you have the binaries get close to 100 AU away from the massive black hole. Okay. Which is too far, too close to the SR. Is that true? Um, no, it's not, but I don't think I can um, okay. do it off the top of my head. So really I can't do it with a process of best manifestation of the Oh, but she's talking about the same energy arsenal as the Right, so that doesn't change. The resonance, right? The resonance, well, with the star that left behind, usually has a more circular object, right? The star left behind? Yeah. You think, no, the star left behind will well, have a very high incentive order. The, the stars that left behind will have a small carryout, about 100 AU, and then you can use that code, and then you want to use resonance to move the line. Right. That's a uh, different process. Come again, That's my first question. The second question I have is that there is also, besides from this, this star, there's also a second population, which is more isotropic, the OD stars. Yeah. So what would they do to your mechanism? Um, the mechanism, the... The, the interesting instability. Um, so, uh, the, the short answer is not so much. Uh, they, they would provide the, the relevant um, retrograde precession. That then slowly depends upon. But um, they are not in the disk. No, that's true, they don't need to be in the disk. Um, well, there's an isotropic B star population. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, so, yeah, okay, so the, the stars within the disk, they will feel stellar torques from other stars that are not in the disk, but the time scale that that will act to change the angular momentum vectors and, and scalar. Um, Values is much longer than the time scale for the instability within the disk. And those torques within the disk are going to be much stronger because the stars are all uh, initially aligned and coherently eccentric. Okay. There are not other questions there, but they are not common. So, in uh, respect to the galactic center car, so the uh, time scale of the Yeah, I don't think they have. 
Thank you. 